Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning. Uh, thanks everyone for joining the CSI's event on securing the critical mineral supply chains. There are quite a few energy and climate related events uh, in, you know, happening around the world and certainly in Washington DC, least of which is the Climate Leaders Summit, uh, but you are at the right event this morning because uh, you know, securing critical mineral supply chains is a hugely important issue uh, for the deployment of the clean energy technologies. And that in turn is very important for the climate mitigation efforts that are underway. Um, you know, the climate, uh, the cr uh, cr critical mineral supply chain uh, is, you know, has become a security uh, st strategic issue. Um, uh, there's, you know, while there's no universal definition, but critical minerals are, uh, you know, something that are very essential to the economic security and also national security. Uh, and, you know, they do provide, when it comes to the uh, more, uh, clean energy, they do provide very important properties in clean energy technologies. Uh, things like uh, neodymium, uh, rare earth, one of the uh, rare earth elements, provide uh, our essential ingredients in permanent magnets. Uh, also, uh, minerals like cobalt and lithium are key in lithium iron batteries uh, that are used in electric vehicles. Uh, last month, the CSIS released uh, this uh, report that looks at the geopolitical uh, sort of evolution in uh, strategies that are uh, put out by key economies in how to strengthen their supply chains. And uh, there's, um, and I'm so glad that you can join us because I'd like to spend uh, some time going over some of the key uh, highlights from that report. Uh, so, um, you know, one, uh, the one of the first uh, highlights is that you know clean energy technology and also component mineral supply chains has emerged as an area of geoeconomic competition between China and the West. Um, at, as this uh, graph to your right shows, uh, China has a very strong position uh, along the value chains for batteries, wind and solar PV, and their component minerals. Uh, for example, uh, China accounts for over 90% of the solar PV wafer manufacturing capacity today. Uh, China seems to now recognize that uh, the strength of its critical mineral supply chains is a geopolitical leverage. During uh, one of the heights of the US-China trade wars back in 2019, uh, President Xi Jinping of China visited a rare earth uh, processing facility in Jiangxi province. Uh, and that visit was widely seen as sort of a warning to the United States and perhaps to the West in general, or, you know, or um, at least a reminder that the United States is highly dependent on China for rare earth um, uh, minerals. Um, and that really uh, elevated concern among uh, Western policymakers uh, that uh, you know, such a significant de dependence on China for something as critical as bare earth may translate into a vulner uh, vulnerability that could be exploited by China in the event of a geopolitical conflict. Uh, and uh, so that is, you know, that, uh, so there are all these, um, some of, uh, that's some of the more recent uh, indications, uh, as well as back in 2010, when uh, over a territorial conflict between China and Japan, uh, there was an uh, uh, embargo on rare earth exports from Ch uh, China to Japan. Uh, and so uh, there, that, there has been great interest and sort of a um, concern over uh, the significant, significant dependence that the West has on China in this arena. Uh, the second major uh, sort of a takeaway or observation that we shared, uh, we wanted to share is that China's development of a midstream and downstream cap capabilities has turned the country from a supplier of raw uh, minerals and uh, materials to a key consumer of them. Uh, China has become a higher value manufacturer of, uh, that require growing volume of the minerals, uh, as well as metals uh, that are considered key to clean energy manufacturing. Uh, China's share of the global rare earth consumption grew from roughly 40% in 2014 to 70% uh, in 2014. Uh, in roughly the same 10-year uh, period, uh, China's production of rare earth end-use products also grew by roughly 70%. Uh, 
Um, but it's important to note, though, that domestic mineral supplies is hardly the only indispensable factor in one's ability to secure supply chains. Uh, uh, there's some, you know, there are two excellent examples, uh, in my view. One is that China does not have a commanding position on cobalt production, for example. Nearly 60% of cobalt ore comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but heavy investment in uh, cobalt mines and participation in cobalt smelting projects there have provided China with access to cobalt resources. Uh, China has come to account for roughly 70% of the global cobalt refining capacity. The other example is much closer to home. Uh, that is, you know, the Mountain Pass mine in California produces rare earth, but all the rare earth con concentrates uh, from the mine are currently exported uh, for separation and processing, as the United States lacks the domestic capacity to separate rare earth concentrates and process them into rare earth metals at a commercial scale. Uh, and then uh, sort of key takeaway number three is, you know, China's commanding position along the supply chains for clean energy technologies and their component minerals is a key factor that shapes other economies' strategic responses. Um, and for the purpose of this uh, research at, uh, uh, last year, we uh, focused on US, Japan, and EU. Uh, of course, there are additional factors that shape strategic responses by these key economies. Uh, in fact, Different economies are motivated by different concerns, whether it's the resource endowment profile or industrial structure. In the case of the United States, uh, we rely on import for more, uh, more than uh, half of the annual consumption of 31 out of 35 critical minerals and rare earth. Uh, and the United States lacks any domestic production for 14 of them. The US appears most concerned about critical minerals import dependence that could be exploited geopolitically. Uh, so, you know, national security has been traditionally the prominent driver of US responses. The US government, especially around uh, DOE, has invested in uh, critical minerals related R&D capacity. Uh, while there has been strong uh, sort of continued congressional interest in upstream capacity, as the United States does have various critical minerals and rare earth deposits across the country. But there has been much limited focus, perhaps, on the notion of the circular economy uh, compared to the European Union to date. Uh, but past US strategies did not have a sort of explicit focus on clean energy technologies uh, context uh, in, for, uh, as far as the why you know, we should consider uh, investing much more into securing the critical mineral supply chains go. But there is, a, I, think, I, I think the change is underway uh, given President Biden's focus on climate mitigation, as well as clean, uh, clean energy manufacturing, and of course the national security concern. As to the U, uh, EU strategy, uh, the uh, European Union consists of a variety of economies in terms of their resource endowments and industrial structures. But traditionally, the EU focus has been on the refining and manufacturing industries rather than the extractive industry. Uh, EU sees uh, secure and sustainable uh, clean uh, critical mineral supply chains as a growing challenge to its commitment to deliver on the two interlinked agendas of meeting, one, I mean, meeting its climate neutrality goal, and two, uh, preserving industrial competitiveness. So the sustainable use of natural resources, such as uh, critical minerals for clean energy technologies, comports to a key green, uh, one of the key uh, green deal objectives, uh, which is to promote the efficient use of resources by uh, moving to a circular economy. Uh, one of the recent examples in this department is that uh, in order to underpin this uh, sustain sustainability of battery consumption, uh, European, co uh, Europe European Commission decided back in November 2020 to modernize EU legislation on batteries to facilitate their collection, repurposing, and recycling. Their interest in nurturing this, uh, this battery industry seems to be driving EU's plan to strengthen environmental and labor requirements for the batteries, as this could protect the EU battery market from cheaper imports. Uh, for Japan, which is highly import dependent for uh, critical mineral supplies or for you know, most of the natural resources for that matter, the key concern uh, driving seems to be the effects of supply disruptions on their industrial competitiveness. 
Uh, given the absence of the domestic upstream capacity, Japan has sought to secure its critical mineral supply chains through trade, investment in mining projects overseas, stockpiling since 1984, and R&D in substitutes and recycling technologies. Uh, Japan accelerated its supplier diversification away from China after uh, the, you know, uh, the 2010 embargo that I mentioned a little earlier, um, embargo on rare earth minerals to Japan over a territorial dispute. Uh, so in supplier, uh, such, you know, supplier diversification step, together with material reuse and substitute development, has resulted in the reduction of Japan's reliance on Chinese rare earth supplies from uh, roughly 85% back in 2009, down to uh, roughly 60% in 2018. Uh, some of the, uh, Japan's most recent steps to strengthen the critical mineral supply chains include uh, expanding the stockpiling, both uh, the mineral types, uh, mineral types and also duration of the, um, the stockpile uh, uh, volume uh, basis of the stockpile requirement. Uh, but then also expansion of financial functions of JAGMEC, which is an entity that's affiliated with Japan's economic ministry and has the statutory authority to make strategic investments abroad to enhance Japan's energy security. And lastly, uh, the, you know, the, the, the uh, innovation is hugely important. Um, you know, when we look at the sort of geopolitics of energy, uh, or I'm sorry, the geopolitics of really oil, uh, oil-based sort of energy geopolitics, you know, innovations such as horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing has helped to really diminish oil's currency as a geopolitical asset. Not that it's, it's you know, it has gone away, but it has diminished and altered the geopolitics between oil producing economies, as well as their relationships with oil import dependent economies. Uh, so uh, in our view, the innovation such as you know, substitute development also, and also recycling technologies has potential to allevi alleviate uh, the, the current critical mineral supply chain concern and to manage uh, the growing competition over resources and clean energy manufacturing value chains. So I invite everyone to take a, a you know, quick look at the CSS report on this issue and really join us in sort of following sort of a, a geopolitical sort of evolution uh, of the strategic responses going forward. Now, let me introduce a shift to the panel discussion. Let me introduce our excellent um, uh, pa panel of experts. Um, so uh, join me, joining me today um, are uh, Andrew Miller, who's the pro uh, product director of the Benchmark uh, Minerals Intelligence, um, and also Andrew DeWitt. He is a professor of Rikyo University School of Economic Policy Studies, joining us from Tokyo. And Marco Gilly, he is a researcher with the Free University of Brussels, joining us from Brussels. Um, so now let me uh, go to uh, Andy Miller first. Um, you know the, um, you know speaking of this critical minerals re uh, report that we released last month, uh, the timing couldn't have been better in that it was shortly after uh, the uh, President Biden's uh, uh, Biden Harris administration introduced the executive order. Uh, in late February uh, that called for sort of a short-term 90-day review of the supply chain securities, uh, including in high capacity batteries, such as EV batteries. And uh, so I wanted to uh, you know, invite you and sort of give us sort of a uh, opening, you know, um, sort of a, uh, remarks, perhaps for six to seven minutes uh, on, you know, how you uh, see the, you know, this, the U.S. both public and private sectors is starting to sort of address challenges in the supply chains, and uh, what are some of the aspects that may warrant a particular focus going forward? Yeah, thanks very much, Jane, and uh, good morning, everyone. I appreciate you organizing the event, and as you say, it's particularly timely given, you know, not just the announcements that we've seen since the start of this year, but I think in particular coming out, hopefully coming out of this COVID pandemic, um, because, you know, what that's really heightened is the convergence of both industry in, in pushing forward the, the, the move towards, 
um, the energy transition, clean energy, and also energy storage supply chains, but also the industry. So the industry has been investing billions of dollars in this for a number of years now. Um, now having the, the some of the stimulus efforts post-COVID or, or pre-COVID, hopefully coming out of COVID, pushing that agenda forward um, is particularly important. But I think, you know, what the big challenge for any country now trying to to displace China's dominance over these supply chains is really the, the, the factor that when the, the efforts go in at one stage and they don't take into account each step in the supply chain, it's very difficult to build out that competitiveness and to be able to really assert yourself in, in this industry. So I think, you know, when you look across the supply chain, if you look for, for, for um, energy storage, this is for batteries, around 80% uh, of the downstream side of things is controlled by China today. In the upstream, that goes to about 66%, about two thirds of the world's anode and cathode, the sort of input materials to a battery are controlled by China. Um, and if you look at the, um, the refining of the raw materials, the critical minerals that goes into these batteries, about 80% of that's controlled by China. So they have a huge dominance across this spectrum of the supply chain. Now, the real issue is if, if you're looking and the real issue that I think industry have found in particular over the past few years, um, if you look at the major OEMs, the Western automakers, as they put in place these major electric vehicle intentions and come up with some really massive numbers, we've seen it happen over the past few years where big statements have been made without particularly knowing how you line up the, 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 the needed steps in the supply chain to actually um, enact those type of expansions and that type of electrification. So you know, the, the, the intermediate steps in the supply chain ultimately can be, addressed, can be addressed by money, right? You can build a battery plant. I can build an anode and cathode facility. But when you work back to the raw material level, that's an area where it's, it's, it's far less easy to control that step in the supply chain. It's not just about how much money you have on the table. It's about geology. It's about um, te technical capabilities. And all of that really um, is going to be a massive challenge for, for the US, for Europe, for anyone trying to displace China over the coming few years. So I think you know, from our perspective, it's become abundantly clear that whoever holds the, whoever has control over these supply chains will really hold the keys to the entire energy transition over the coming decades. So it's, it's incredibly important. That's why it's incredibly important that countries around the world start to tackle this. And, um, you know, in terms of how they tackle this, and you outlined that as one of your questions in, in, um, in preparation for this, you know, how do we start to address this? And it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, but maybe someone hadn't asked me as, as directly, how do you deal with this? And it made me think, you know, what in the context of China, and I think a lot of the, the discussion gets framed around China being this risk factor, right? China having so much control is a risk to everyone else. And it's a threat to US national security, European national security, which certainly is the case. But I think actually we can start looking at China, particularly in the context of energy storage and clean energy, as a bit more of a blueprint that we can work towards rather than a, 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 you know, just a competitor in this space. And if you use that Chinese blueprint, you know, as you mentioned, I think in your slides, Jane, if you look at this actually right the way back to the mine and what's happening at the mining level, it's not that China necessarily controls everything that's coming out of the mine. When you look at the lithiums, cobalts, nickels of the world, it's not that China has a massive control at that step of the supply chain. We estimate about 25% of the raw materials going into battery uh, applications is mined in China, so far less than the two thirds, 70, 80% that you see in the downstream steps. What they've done very strategically is invest aggressively in that refining step. If you take the next step along the supply chain, you're, you're not beholden to geology. You know, you can only control what's in the ground in your country or what economics are around it. But if you invest in that refining, you have the technical capabilities to turn that into something that can go into the, the these higher end um, applications and energy, clean energy applications, then what you do is you control the flow of material. Cobalt isn't just coming from the DRC and going into your battery. It all has to go through China now. Even though China, China doesn't mine it themselves, they control the flow of trade. And I think that is a in terms of a blueprint and how you may start, you know, putting in place in the steps to really um, uh, to really answer some of these these questions about how you, you you challenge that Chinese dominance. I think that's a real blueprint in terms of 
you know, knowing that you have to have all these steps in the supply chain. There's no point in building a lithium mine in the US if you have no cathode market to sell into, right? Uh, is building out the steps in unison and, and um, working um, from a supply chain perspective uh, to, to address these issues rather than just saying, let's put X amount of dollars into electric vehicles or let's put X amount of dollars into batteries, build out the entire supply chain. So um, I've tried to get, keep my comments brief there, but hopefully that opens us up to some questions. That was excellent, Andy. Thank you. And I, I'm, uh, I appreciate how you, you know, underscore that the need for sort of a complete, you know, uh, look at the complete supply chain, because I, I don't, you know, uh, the United States does have wealth of resources. And I think there's a lot of interest and it's important uh, to look into, you know, some of the resources we have. But certainly the idea here isn't for the U.S. to become lower and, you know, just a bare, you know, mineral mining country to supply other countries manufacturing boom, right, in clean energy technologies. So, no, I really appreciate your very thoughtful, um, you know, I think perfectly timed six minute uh, <laughs> comment. Thank you. Um, and now um, on to uh, Andrew uh, DeWitt, if, if I may. So, um, you know, Japan has rolled out very strong climate commitments in recent, I think, months, you know, certainly in the past, perhaps nine months to 12 months, uh, including mid-century uh, net zero pledge last fall. But then just yesterday, uh, Prime Minister Suga announced uh, the Japan's 2030, uh, you know, uh, Nash, uh, NDC, uh, nationally determined uh, commitment of 46% reduction. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of uh, really, you know, uh, encouraging signs, but obviously, you know, Japan is notoriously poor in domestic uh, natural resources. So I wanted to turn to you, um, Andrew, and ask you to share your thoughts on how, uh, you know, how um, I guess, how these commitments, climate comm commitments, and their expanded focus on clean energy technologies, including also, you know, obviously in the uh, sort of an EV um, energy storage technologies mean for Japan's approach to uh, critical mineral supply chains. Well, thank you, Jane. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, event. And um, in, in answering that, uh, today's Nikkei uh, newspaper argues um, uh, that uh, regarding uh, the Suga's commitment of uh, 46 percent cut uh, by uh, 2030, that uh, this lofty climate pledge demands a radical energy innovation. Um, what they neglected to add was that the, uh, the pledge uh, will also require a lot of rare metals, rare earths, and other critical raw materials. Um, well, Japan might be moving. It, it may be moving towards quantifying the enormous scale of its own critical uh, minerals challenge, critical raw materials challenge. For example, the Ministry of Economy uh, and Industry, Trade and Industry, or METI, recently um, noted that installing just 10 gigawatts of offshore wind, it's about three nuclear reactors worth of power generation by 2030, would require roughly 10% of Japan's 2018 copper consumption and 20% of its niobium rare earth consumption. The METI is mooting 45 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2040, which implies a lot of critical minerals demand that won't be met by recycling and substitution. And that demand is on top of critical mineral requirements for other clean energy generation, transmission and storage, electrified mobility, 5G communications, data centers, and other elements of Japan's critical mineral intensive society 5.0, decarbonization, smart city, etc. industrial policy ambitions. So I think it's striking that Japan has yet to ballpark uh, the overall critical mineral requirements for its goals. That's in spite of a decade of EU funded scoping and other studies that increasingly assess global demand across power, mobility, communications, health tech, military, space, and other categories. To quote an editorial in this month's edition of the academic journal Materials, the indisputable conclusion after about 10 years of finalized critical raw materials projects research is that the most advanced technologies required for the green and digital trans, uh, transition will lead to a drastic increase in demand. So, you know, uh, 
One looks in vain for comprehensive critical minerals assessments from within Japan, in spite of, as you pointed out, its lack of terrestrial critical mineral endowments. Um, indeed, the METI calculation of copper and niobium requirements for offshore wind is based on International Energy Agency data. But Japan's offshore wind may be more material intensive due to greater oceanic depths, project distance from the shore, and distance from centers of power consumption. So one would expect Japanese policymakers to be arguing to the extent possible on the basis of Japan-specific critical mineral requirements. And let's not forget that Japan not only needs access to prodigious amounts of uh, critical minerals, but also higher ESG com uh, compliant quality. So it's not just quantity, it's also ESG compliant quant uh, quality. Japan has to catch up with Canada, Norway, Sweden, and other countries on green nickel, green copper, and other ESG compliant critical minerals. But to sum up here, uh, we'll have to see over the coming months if Japan calculates its likely critical uh, mineral requirements and includes that kind of data in its upcoming basic energy strategy, its quad initiatives, and other policies. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. That was very comprehensive. And again, uh, right uh, on the dot. Uh, perfect. Um, now on to Marco, uh, based in Brussels. Uh, you know, I think that the uh, European Union has been most proactive in recognizing this linkage between the climate-induced need for clean energy technologies uh, or the faster deployment and uh, the resilience of the mineral supply chains, as well as uh, what that may mean for the industrial competitiveness, uh, including in uh, battery value chains. Uh, so, Mark, could you help us sort of unpack some of the, uh, you know, deeper into the key drivers uh, that are behind uh, EU's critical and uh, raw material strategy and how that may then uh, going forward continue to evolve? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Many thanks uh, for this uh, insightful report uh, and for the invitation to expound um, some reflection on the EU's positioning in the current geopolitics of critical raw materials. Um, so the basically the key challenge for Europe is is pretty uh, simple. It's a combination between an expansive outlook for demand and the EU's almost absence uh, in the upstream sections of the critical raw materials value chains, notably extraction, processing, and refining. And this gave, of course, rise to the recognition um, of the possible emergence of supply uh, issues in the coming years uh, and decades. Uh, the latest criticality assessment of the European Commission uh, done in 2020 with respect to 2017 um, highlighted that the severe growth in the supply risk uh, of rare earth elements, germanium and cobalt, um, and uh, to some extent lithium as well, but starting from a uh, less problematic starting point let's say. So if one has to translate what does this uh, re what, what these risks are, are um, it's uh, Europe's fears are mostly for uh, export restrictions. These are not necessarily framed in geopolitical terms. In the EU mindset, these restrictions are not necessarily read as instrumental to put political um, coercion, uh, but rather as means for supplier countries to develop their own value chains in uh, um, unfairly competitive terms. Um, a second order of risk uh, is the risk of becoming an unintended casualty in US-China geoeconomic warfare. Um, what happens if the sanctions are enacted at some point? Um, then uh, a third threat is state fragility uh, of certain suppliers. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, one may think about cobalt supply in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and finally, the competition for access under um, unregulated, uh, uh, under unregulated standards. Uh, one can think again about lithium, neodymium, and so on. So why it's quite important for the EU to, to, to get ahead of, this, uh, of these challenges. Uh, I mean, first of course, material interests. The, these materials are 
essential for a number of initiatives and policy areas where the EU is showing an increasing appetite for sovereign actorness, um, digital decarbonization defense. Um, the pandemic has, uh, has heightened the EU's perception on how supply chains disruption can compromise the EU's economic power. Um, also a frequent reason for the uh, EU uh, and European Commission especially to take initiatives is to prevent also that member states under global pressures may develop their own industrial strategies and, and this may endanger the single market integrity or they may adopt unilateral engagement to foreign suppliers that may compromise the EU's geopolitical stand and in the story of traditional energy, I mean, we have seen this um, many times. Uh, there are also important ideational grounds. Uh, there is a strong connection with the notion of strategic autonomy that you is trying to develop, although the concept remains yet quite uh, subjective and underdeveloped. Uh, now, coming at how the EU should position itself in this uh, in this complex situation. Um, first, Kevin, it, it is. Um, often argued that you should uh, adapt to current geopolitical realities uh, and develop geopolitical actorness, uh, realities where interdependencies are uh, no longer a source of harmony uh, and peace and can become a source uh, of conflict and coercion. Um, in a way, this would mean to deprioritize commercial uh, and normative considerations uh, to the benefits of foreign policy um, confrontational framings, let's say. Um, I would propose a different way to, to look at things. Um, the provision of uh, critical raw materials uh, involves policy areas such as trade, research, single market policies, um, where the EU shows a generally unified external actorness in terms of political preferences and institutional structures. Um, this is arguably uh, conducive to more effective action and more coherent policy output and, and outcomes as long as uh, the EU will manage to overcome certain non-interventionist old paradigms and build up uh, a proper industrial policy. What does this mean in practice? Um, the uh, geopolitical actorness may be decline in terms of diversification and domestic extractions. I, I think this has a lot of limits. Um, diversification is, of course, loadable. Uh, dialogue with like-minded countries and suppliers uh, is, of course, uh, important. But again, there are limits. We have seen it, uh, for instance, in Greenland. They recently had elections, and the party that uh, won the election uh, really pushed for not exploiting a very important uh, rare earth elements uh, mine. Uh, Chile is another example. Uh, now uh, we are stuck with the um, review of the uh, free trade agreements with Chile uh, on the topic on uh, export restrictions because Chile as well has its own interest and agency and would like to develop on-site production of batteries as well. Uh, so problems are not just with systemic rival, but also with like-minded countries. Um, the domestic extractions, I won't tell much about that. The EU remains resource poor. Of course, something can be done, but it's not going, certainly not going to be the, the, the silver bullet. Um, so to this extent, the EU remains with few options. One is continue to pursue um, multilat multilateral dialogue and strengthen rules uh, in order to counter the proliferation of potential proliferation of export restrictions at multilateral level. Uh, and then there are most of the areas to invest in are domestic. It's about strategic stockpiling, processing and refining capacity, research on material efficiency, material substitution, and recycling. Um, so all the technologies that are needed to compete for markets, standards, and uh, influence. Uh, maybe it could be considered also schemes of joint procurement. This is not discussed in the EU uh, at the moment. Perhaps the experience of vaccines uh, is, has not been uh, very good, but the EU does joint procurement for uranium uh, since many, many decades. Uh, so this is also a model that can be, uh, that can be considered. So I'm stopping here and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, 
it's it's a uh, I think the report also talks about how in the past uh, the EU did look into the idea of stockpiling, and I think the member countries basically sort of decided against it. And I'm also aware that uh, some of the individual European countries did have uh, some of the, I guess, main, main, perhaps it was more by rare earth oriented rather than uh, you know other critical minerals. Um, but just, I guess, quick sort of a follow-up question to you, Marco, like, do you think there's a renewed appetite in some of the key EU member countries to have, um, I mean, I guess that maybe that's what you're, um, you know, as opposed, uh, you know, maybe that's what you think might be desirable, like, but do you think there may be sort of a you know, potentially critical mass of governments um, uh, uh, sort of joining hands to establish one? I think so far this is not so much discussed and we haven't seen as well also in the um, so far in the raw material initiatives of the EU and, and in the latest uh, and in the latest strategy but of course uh, mood can change uh, on the basis of uh, of the political uh, climate for a long time we didn't have a very strategic approach to the um, um, to the stockpiling of uh, uh, of natural gas then we had the supply crisis in 2006 2009 and then the EU developed uh, a much more resilient um, uh, storage uh, capabilities so this is again uh, very, the EU does have a reactive style to these type of things. So the more things becomes, um, let's say, dramatic, the more we can expect the EU to, to react. Thank you. Uh, no, that makes sense. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, then now, uh, let me actually ask uh, the, everyone, all, all three panelists, uh, uh, some questions um, that I, I been wanting to really uh, pose to you. I mean, one is, um, I think, Marco, you've already sort of touched upon how, you know, the EU's desire not to be caught between uh, this US-China rivalry, but I wanted to sort of get everyone's thoughts um, in, uh, sort of in a much more focused way. You know, I mean, so China does have this commanding position on critical uh, clean energy technologies and also component mineral supply chains. Um, and I think the, the you know, the uh, Washington-Beijing uh, relationship uh, may continue to worsen, um, uh, you know, whether, you know, you like it or not. Um, and I'm just curious to hear your views on how that may affect, you know, Washington um, and, you know, Tokyo and Brussels approaches to balancing some of the competing uh, considerations, such as, you know, the industrial competitiveness national security, but then also climate mitigation. Uh, these are all very important factors that really drive you know, policymakers' um, uh, approach um, to this issue. So uh, maybe back to Andy Miller, uh, if you could. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think if, if tensions keep worsening, I think the risk is at the moment that you don't have, you know, ultimately, if, if China is is taken out of this equation in any way, then you will have significant bottlenecks. You know, the industry is already facing, the, the global picture is already pretty strained. And if you look across the sort of critical minerals that we focus on, your lithiums, cobalts, nickels, graphites, each one of them between now, if in the case of lithium and the 26, 27 for nickel, within that time frame, each one of these is going to move into a each one of these raw materials is going to move into a period of, of real structural deficit. Um, and, the, you know, so the race is really on across these raw materials. You take China out of the equation. I think that obviously makes things more difficult. Um, there are, as I mentioned, you know, there are aspects of the supply chain that can be built out in a relatively short time frame. You know, I think it's really positive. Um, obviously, the LG SK dispute in the US, um, that, that being resolved, you know, gives gives a more momentum towards the build out of the battery cell production, which is great. Um, you see the likes of Tesla. There's not very much happening at that next step up, the sort of cathode anode level. But Tesla made some into their battery day last year that they're going to be looking to develop that, and maybe one or two other battery producers will do the same. Those steps can be addressed in a, in a reasonably short amount of time, and you can make yourself relatively competitive. The issue, well, you can make yourself competitive if you're selling into US electric vehicles, that is. The issue is upstream and, and you know, you, you develop a new resource, a new mine for, to, um, for any of these operations. You're talking 
five years at the best, and then to develop the, the processing, refining technology to produce a high proportion of battery grade materials, you're looking at another two to three years. So the, the raw material, the critical, the critical, you know, component in this is the critical minerals because there is there is such a long lead time and i think that's one thing that you know automotive companies have, have taken a long time to to come to terms with and try and develop their strategy towards but i think in terms of the po political and policy discussion around this is often forgotten as well it's not that you can just turn on the tap even perhaps within one administration and answer these questions it's a much longer term um, plan that you have to have in place Thank you so much, Andy. Um, actually, if I may ask a quick follow-up question to that, um, but the you know the I guess um, energy investment in general from China to the U.S. has been sort of going down, decreasing. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, it's actually sort of overall maybe there is you know shift away from uh, Chinese investment into some of the energy projects within the United States, perhaps to more about venture capital type of stuff uh, away from you know, infrastructure heavy. And I was just curious as to whether uh, not the trade element, but the investment side of uh, you know, Chinese, um, uh, US-China relations may or may not affect. Uh, I don't know if Chinese investment has ever been significant part of uh, U.S., particularly in mining, uh, I would imagine there's a lot of more about national security screening that's there. But if that's something that you you know also follow, uh, I, I'd be interested in your view. Yeah, so from, from a battery perspective, you know, China has had, you know, been very successful, as I mentioned, in sort of making very strategic investments, particularly, I'd say, on the mining side of things. I think when you look at what's happening further downstream, the US and Europe are trying to very heavily align themselves with some of the, the historical leaders in this space. So you look to Japan, you look to Korea, you look to your Panasonic, Samsung's, uh, those type of companies, and that those are the ones making big commitments. But Again, it doesn't really address that upstream uh, problem in the supply chain. It's, it's, taking, it's still one, two steps removed from that, where you are seeing really heavy, heavy influence of China. You know, when you look at one step beyond the battery, the anode and cathode, China controls over 90% of the world's anode production today, and it controls around over about 70% of the world's cathode production. So hugely dominant at that step. And then like we've talked about the mining refining step, it has that control as well. And, and that's where I'd say we're seeing more on the investment side of things from a Chinese perspective, is when you look at, and going back to the point about, you don't have to necessarily mine the raw materials yourselves, but if you have a strategic position in where those materials are being mined, then you, you, you can control that, that flow of trade again. And that's what China has been and still is quite aggressively doing in terms of making strategic investments in where these materials will be mined. They can do the refining themselves and do that value adding along the supply chain themselves domestically. Um, so that's what, that's what I'm seeing on the battery side. Great, thank you, Andy. Um, and let me turn to you, Andrew. Um, and how does you know, US sort of China uh, growing tension uh, is you know uh, affecting Tokyo's approach to uh, the critical mineral supply chain security considerations? Yes, that that makes things difficult as well as opens up opportunities, doesn't it? Um, on the first thing, you know, you have uh, you have extant collaboration between the United States and Japan on on uh, critical raw materials dating back, for example, to um, 2013, uh, working with the U.S. Department of Energy's Ames Institute on the effective use of critical materials. Uh, more recently, you have the, the Quad Summit uh, Mar in March uh, between the US, Japan, Australia, and India, in, which had, you know, had uh, attention to bolstering critical mineral supply chains. Um, so these, these kinds of uh, initiatives are all very important. Um, they could be expanded. Uh, you know, to give one example, just one example, um, Japan could join the US, Canada, Australia, Earth MRI um, um, mapping resources initiative uh, on uh, mapping critical minerals, climate hazards, and renewable energy opportunities. Uh, maybe Japan could bring India into the mix. There's only about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, only about 10% of India's geology uh, has been explored apparently, uh, 
uh, and it too needs a lot of critical um, minerals. So you know you could uh, evolve that collaboration. Um, so I think key is a broader portfolio of collaboration. Uh, uh, to put it, I don't know how to put it politely, beyond the U.S., you know, <laughs> not to be too reliant. Uh, that might help Japan balance its dependence on China for critical minerals. Uh, that's like really, as Andy points out, it's really hard to get out of that um, in, in uh, short order and short order being over, you know, several years. Um, so it's got its it dependence on critical minerals in addition to what uh, Moody's uh, recently portrayed as the uh, almost inevitable ongoing economic integration of Japan, China, and South Korea. I don't know how Japanese policymakers can find ways to uh, finesse the critical mineral linchpin in this uh, <clears throat> this region's difficult mix of industrial competition, money, industrial policy competition, national security, and climate mitigation and adaptation needs. Um, I, I, I guess I could only suggest that, uh, emphasize that Japan should be working more closely with those uh, EU experts uh, who have been assessing comprehensive critical mineral requirements. Um, in addition to next month, you have the, uh, the International Energy Agency uh, bringing out, I think it's on the 8th, uh, April the 8th, uh, global, the first global comprehensive critical raw materials assessment. Um, and, you know, Japan could be using that uh, to, um, uh, I one would hope, to inform, you know, more robust, better funded policy on supply chain security uh, in, in the Asian context. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, on to Marco. Uh. Um, yeah, I, I think on the um, on the subject of being caught between uh, between U.S. and China, um, I, th I think it's important to uh, acknowledge that a tension between the EU commercial priorities and the uh, U.S. interests with respect to China may exist, but uh, uh, critical raw materials constitute. Uh, in a way, a minor component of this, uh, um, of these priorities and this uh, um, and these uh, issues, um, the EU is growing aware of the strategic dimension uh, of economic interdependence. Um, yet, uh, where it diverges with the US is that it is not planning to decouple uh, from uh, from China. Perhaps some exception maybe uh, in standards in digital ecosystems and so on, but certainly not in, in critical raw materials um, for several reasons. First, the uh, EU itself is built on the belief that interdependence is a sort of inescapable destiny uh, and needs to be managed through institutions. Um, and this applies to the EU's approach to China as well. Um, after all, this type of interdependence that uh, uh, that you is able to uh, is what makes the EU uh, able to spread its influence and values. Um, achieving supply resilience with respect to Russian gas, for instance, uh, did not happen by way of decoupling. We are importing more and more gas from Russia, but we are doing this in increasingly advantageous terms for the, uh, the EU. Um, second, the US-China decoupling is uh, excruciatingly painful for EU firms in terms of cost of adjustment in, in perspective. Um, as such, in the US view to entrench China into Western looking uh, in institutionalized frameworks is preferable to uh, outright geoeconomic confrontation. So the dominant expression in Brussels and the capitals now it's uh, rebalancing or recalibration. Whether this sets uh, a clear uh, path and course of action uh, and approach, that's probably another matter. Great, thank you so much, Marco. I'm starting to get a lot of questions. So let me uh, actually already sort of turn to the audience questions. Uh, and uh, one of them is the, um, actually, let me double check there, qu uh, quite a few. So uh, there, so one question, actually, let me combine a few. Uh, there are, you know, some of the, uh, I think perhaps Andrew already uh, mentioned the ESG concerns. 
but there are all these uh, concerns that are associated. And then there are also these uh, uh, more of a developing resource rich developing economies who uh, have uh, sort of a very still limited understanding of their resource potential and et cetera. What are some of the ways to really work with these economies and perhaps uh, be part of constructive engagement, sort of help them along the way in perhaps uh, benefiting more from this growing demand for minerals and uh, for the clean energy technology demand, uh, but then also uh, ensuring that uh, the operations are done in an environmentally and climate uh, sustainable manners. Um, any taker? Raise a hand. <laughs> a, brief one, a brief one from my side, and I think a good a good case study in that is sort of what you've seen in the over the past year when you start, start. I know a lot of this comes back to Elon Musk, but on the EV side. But when you saw him make some comments about um, the sustainability of nickel and the access to green nickel, um, that had big shockwaves along the supply chain. And I suppose you know rather than just making it a Tesla issue, when you um, when these issues are framed from the perspective of the consumer facing brands um, by that, you know, I mean, the VWs of the world, the Teslas of the world, um, they're the ones where the real pressure to ensure the sustainability of the supply chain is really coming. No one's thinking about a small lithium producer, um, you know, what they're doing individually. They're not thinking about an anode or cathode guy in the supply chain. They're thinking about when something gets tied to the batteries going into your, your vehicle that you're purchasing. And I think that supply chain integration, understanding and cooperation is really how you can help to develop these type of resources in other parts of the world and make sure that they're developed to certain standards. Um, because that, that you know, we've already seen a, a, a lot of really positive momentum off the back of not just Tesla, but off the back of that, a number of other automotive companies came out and spoke out against some of the issues with, with um, deep sea tailings in that instance, but around other ESG issues that have sort of emerged um, before and since then. So I think that's a really, you know, supply chain interaction and cooperation and not just expecting someone to develop a mine and, and sort of independently of, of where the ultimate end market's going to be is really key in that. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, and if I may add a little bit, I think the World Bank has been putting a lot of resource and effort into uh, things such as, uh, uh, I think, climate smart mining initiative. Uh, really, the idea is to really allow these, you know, resource rich developing countries to benefit but then also, you know, obviously, uh, help uh, on uh, all these key elements uh, to really make the, the footprint of their uh, extractive activities as uh, minimal or you know sustainable as possible. And and certainly, uh, the State Department has invested quite a bit in this uh, 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 multilateral framework called uh, Energy Resource Governance Initiative, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the idea was to, you know, uh, the focus was much more on the governance side. Uh, but they're uh, engaging a lot of countries that do have resources and try to really uh, make the mining uh, activities to be as sustainable as possible. So it's it's definitely an area um, that will become uh, even more important. I mean, as important as uh, investment in uh, technologies like recycling, I mean, there still has to be a lot more mining, whether it's, you know, in any of the countries that uh, this report, CSIS report, took a close look at or not. Uh, I think the low carbon future is, uh, you know, known to be uh, quite uh, mineral intensive. So uh, these things have to go in hand in hand. Um, the actually, uh, some of the things that Andy just mentioned uh, relate to some of the questions that I'm starting to get from the audience. Uh, one of the, the questions is about sort of a potential of um, tailings. You know, the, I think it really relates to this ESG conversation, you know, what to do with uh, the mineral life cycle. Uh, if anyone has, you know, sort of further thoughts on, you know, like how significant is that? Like where, you know, it's going? Uh, I definitely welcome that. And, and also in the meantime, uh, some of you can uh, also add, um, there's also a question about um, the deep sea mining harvesting. I think that's something that uh, if Japan at least uh, for one, and I think there's also, I'm forgetting, um, uh, but I think maybe within the US, I mean, there, there are a couple uh, interesting initiatives that are going on. and. How do we understand sort of the ESG profile of deep sea mining that will be done, you know, assuming in a the careful, you know, 
uh, as you know, uh, sort of a responsible manner as possible, but compared to uh, onshore. Any taker? Okay, Andrew, uh, please. Uh, yeah, actually, that's uh, an interesting uh, uh, debate. Um, as you know, Japan is is uh, proposing Jog Mac is is going to. Uh, it says it's going to start harvesting. Uh, in its own economic zone, it's going to start harvesting uh, critical raw materials uh, from 2028. Uh, but uh, even uh, before that, the, um, there's a Canadian firm called Deep Green, which has been uh, quite aggressive in art making the case that uh, deep sea mining is, uh, in fact, more environmentally sustainable uh, than uh, terrestrial uh, mining, uh, that it has a lower impact uh, 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 and uh, one would hope that, uh, you know, it, you would think that Japan would be uh, working with um, uh, players like that uh, because, you know, I mean, whether you, one agrees with Deep Green's take or not, and many people don't, it's quite controversial, these ongoing arguments in the, the, uh, the International Seabed Authority. Um, but... Uh, there is, you know, they they have academic work in the Journal of Cleaner Production, for example, that that purports to show that there's a significant difference in environmental impact, a lower impact in seabed mining versus terrestrial mining, and you know, you would think that Japan would be, you know, leading that kind of assessment. We're in an in fact, it's uh, rather behind on, on assessing the ESG implications of critical raw materials. As I said, it's, it's yet to fully count its critical raw material um, requirements um, in, in terms of quantity. Uh, but what about the quality? You know, one would hope that it's ongoing policy. Because so much of this policy is in flux here, um, perhaps it can be um, linked to these uh, ESG concerns that are generally associated with what the Europeans are doing on taxonomy issues and so forth. Um, so I, it, it's a matter of hope rather than saying, you know, what they're actually doing. Um, anyway, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, anyone uh, who would like to add some? Uh, if not, then actually I do also have a couple of questions uh, somewhat related to ESG, but really the European approach, because you, uh, Europe has been, uh, as I said, you know, has always recognized the linkage, but most proactive. Uh, so quickly, maybe in one minute, Marco, I'm sorry to do this too, but you know, how uh, do these sort of renewed, even sort of a doubling down on some of these, um, you know, commitments, climate commitments on top of the already sort of ESG conscious society really mean to, uh, the access to resource that's that has not been easy uh, to begin with. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, that's partly what I was uh, um, referring to before. Uh, when the EU has, uh, in a way, uh, underdeveloped its diversification discourse, there's also uh, an important normative uh, component uh, in this. Um, the idea is not to be uh, seen um, as sort of practicing some um, extractivist uh, discourse uh, that may look like something same old, same old, uh, without taking so much into consideration uh, environmental uh, issues. And this is also the reason why the EU is instead insisting so much and uh, putting the uh, majority of its eggs in the uh, in the recycling uh, basket. Uh, so this is, uh, in a way, the way uh, the EU is trying to squaring uh, this uh, this circle, and all goes down uh, to the idea that uh, the current supply structures of the EU is not going to uh, undergo very significant change in the in the forthcoming future uh, the idea is that this is perhaps not going to change so much over the last decade but then when the technology cycle uh, comes in with recycling with material efficiency with material substitution as well uh, we can uh, reconcile all the agenda and then uh, everything will be in uh, in its place <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Um, I think we're almost uh, there. So let me just um, sort of, you know, I, I'm really grateful for all your contributions and perspectives. And in many ways, you know, obviously there's already competition among these economies, uh, you know, not just, you know, sort of a vis-a-vis -vis China, but, you know, uh, between Europe, EU and Japan. And, and of course there's Australia, Canada, there's so many, and also India also has, uh, you know, increasing stake in this uh, global critical mineral supply chains. Uh, but I think, you know, there is still scope for uh, cooperation and some of them could be uh, much more in the innovation side. But then I think the idea isn't so much to really, let's say, displace China. You know, China does have commanding position, but there is, uh, I think, now that China is also becoming increasingly import dependent for its mineral requirements, I think, you know, it may, there may be a... Um, sort of opportunity to really together look much more closely at the expected demand and uh, the, you know, both the potential and limitation of different um, pillars of the uh, strategic responses, uh, you know, how much recycling can contribute, so how much, you know, recovery, you know, how this uh, tailing, you know, uh, ex uh, exploring more of a life cycle of minerals, all these things, uh, you know, China certainly has expertise. They haven't stopped doing this for the last, 30, 40 years. Uh, so I hope that there's only the beginning of more conversation to look at this, there's certainly geopolitics, but the idea isn't to be alarmed for the alarm, you know, being, you know, being alarming, the sake of being alarmed. Uh, sometimes it could motivate uh, people to start acting, but I think the idea is to better appreciate what is really driving each country's strategy and the needs uh, that are changing, uh, evolving as well. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Uh, please, you know, um, obviously, this, you know, I can't see the audience, but please join me in thanking uh, my excellent panelists today. Um, you know, Andy Miller with Benchmark, uh, Andrew DeWitt with uh, Rikyo University and Marco Gilly with uh, Free, Free University of Brussels. Uh, and thank you everyone out there who have uh, uh, provided with excellent questions and look forward to seeing you uh, again at a future CSIC event.